If Van Dongen reach out to me for Instagram and said that if I'm interested, we may sit down and talk about how orienteering looks like in Netherlands. Oh boy, was I interested! But on top of this, I want to make sure that everybody knows that Eve is such an amazing person and runner. So she started orienteering in 2018 and in 2022 she won the first ever medal on walk for Netherlands in a sprint distance, knockout sprint distance. So isn't that amazing? After four years of doing orienteering, starting in an elite class, getting to the medal position, unfortunately, we're not going to be talking about this in that interview. We're actually going to be talking about orienteering in Netherlands, a little bit about her journey. Um, I also had a discussion that will be published on Patronite about her work and her passions and her beginnings. and. Uh, that was super interesting as well because she's the first person I've ever met who is, uh, who is uh, taking care of glaciers and uh, doing scientific studies around that. Super interesting stuff, uh, very connected to uh, currently very important topics like climate change and global warming. Uh, so a little bit scary. We had a short discussion about that, uh, but then uh, we thought that maybe a longer talk around this area is for another time and, and place. So hopefully we will get the chance to meet again in the future. Uh, I want to take also an opportunity right here to thank all of those that are supporting me and Mati on the journey with this channel. Super grateful to all of you. Keep supporting us. If you want to support us financially, then the link to the Patreon will be in the description of this video. And if you just want to support us for free, then you can always just subscribe, like the content, put the comment underneath it, or share the videos with your friends, with your clubs, because more and more stuff is already on the channel. And I feel like this has become quite a good knowledge base for everybody to learn from. Also, just today, a moment ago, I finished the last webinar of the Orienteering Academy, the seventh one. What a journey that was. So I'm still very excited uh, about how it all went and finished. And I'm already thinking about more editions of Orienteering Academy in the future. If you want to be notified when the new edition will be starting, then also in the description of, of this video, you will find the link to the newsletter list. So just sign up and whenever a new thing will be coming up, you will be the first person to know. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet Eve. Welcome everybody. Today I'm going to talk with Eve and she was kind enough to reach out to me and uh, we exchanged some uh, things regarding the channel, but she also suggested that if I want to, we can sit down and chat about orienteering in Netherlands. And of course I was interested because I'm very interested about orienteering all around the world. And Netherlands seems like a uh, maybe not exotic country. It's not like Kenya, for example, uh, that, that would be exotic to me or Costa Rica. Uh, but still, I know that Netherlands is not that big when it comes to orienteering. So I'm always interested in learning how those countries work as well. And I'm also happy to share you know, some insights from uh, other countries so that we can all grow together and maybe learn some cool ideas from all different parts of the world. And I definitely was able to discover some things from the previous discussion. So who knows, maybe we will all discover something from today's discussion. So Eve, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. So we had a, a short discussion before we started this part of, of the talk where Eve is currently um, in Sweden. She's also been doing orienteering in Norway, in Switzerland as well. And so, so I guess even though I would say if you're pretty new to orienteering because you said you started in 2017, was it? 18. 18, sorry, 18. So it's like, what, five years ago? Five years for me, it's like a, an orienteer that is uh, um, in, intermediately advanced. <laughs> so you're definitely still a few steps from being an expert, not the beginning, definitely not a beginner. Uh, and you already have a lot of experience, but uh, you, uh, orienteering is not a very difficult sport and it takes years to master it. So you're probably somewhere on that path, aren't you? 
Yeah, right. yeah. Of course, I hope to to keep on improving. But uh, because of your you moving around, um, have you been moving around because of your job? So uh, for those of you that don't know, I know already. But if is um, uh, uh, taking care of or maybe scientifically um, doing work around glaciers uh, and I guess climate change, how it, how it impacts the glaciers and everything that surrounds that. So have you been traveling ar around because of the job? Yeah, so in um, 2018, when I started orienteering, uh, I was doing my PhD in Zurich, in uh -huh. Switzerland. And I was actually studying glaciers on Greenland. So I was also traveling to Greenland and I, I wanted to do orienteering there because it actually exists there. So that would definitely be one on the, the list of exotic places. Definitely. Um, yeah, there is, uh, I think it's every year, Arctic midnight orienteering in Greenland. Nice. And um, I was supposed to change flights to go to our field work. And usually those flights are always delayed. And I knew that the next day there would be midnight orienteering on Greenland. So I hoped that I would miss the connecting flight. But this one time <laughs> we made our connection. So I missed the orienteering, unfortunately. Oh, sorry to yeah. hear that. Are, are they usually late because of the weather or? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's because the landing strips are very short and then somehow there shouldn't be fog, uh, not in the place where the plane is coming from, where it's like, where you have to change and then where it's going. So just, it's the weather conditions that quite often uh, make it impossible to fly. Yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, you were able to travel and live in several different places, all very famous for orienteering. So you obviously have a lot of experience. Uh, but you also know how orienteering works in the Netherlands. So let's talk about that. Um, how many clubs are there in the Netherlands when we're talking about orienteering competitions? Yeah, so there's, there's really like um, a federation for orienteering. And then there is five clubs, uh, which is not many for 17 million people. Uh, and the number of members is approximately 450, something around that. And I, I actually looked it up once because I was uh, curious. I think there are 450 clubs in Sweden. So that's a bit, <laughs> give this, this scale. There is as many clubs in Sweden as people <clears throat> knowing about orienteering in the Netherlands. Okay, yeah, that, that puts things in perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm guessing that the clubs, uh, they, they sound like they are pretty big, at least on average. They have almost 100 people per club. So they are probably organized around bigger uh, urban areas. Yeah, well, compared to Sweden, you could say that the Netherlands is an urban area. There is like, uh, if you travel between cities, uh, it's not a lot of places where you would see forest or uh, there would mainly yeah. be fields. And you will always, it's very hard to be in the Netherlands and not see a house somewhere on the horizon. Or yeah, it's a, a lot of... Um, impact by humans so uh, the clubs are quite like spread geographically uh, and then the maps are also quite spread uh, partly because there's not that many forests to map <laughs> yeah right I, i've only been to amsterdam so i don't know how netherlands looks like outside of the you know capital city uh, but i know that you have lots of ground that was taken away from the sea right uh, by the the how do you how do you say it in english the, the sorry i think you say dikes dikes um, yeah. what, what does that mean like the um, sand walls to keep the water away ah okay dikes yeah i didn't know that word Okay, cool. Uh, we all learn something new every day. Uh, so yeah, you have, and that land, I, I'm guessing that it's mostly, actually, I don't know. What is it used for? Is it agriculture or is it um, also used for um, habitual, habitual um, or sorry, residential um, places? Yeah, it, it's not that much land, which is like yeah taken up from the sea or like where there used to be water uh, but that part is mainly agricultural and also people live there yeah okay so it's actually both yeah and so which part of the country would you say is uh, the most adaptable when it comes to orienteering so it has forests and has interesting terrains to run through not entirely flat 
<laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> most of the parts are quite flat. So it's, <laughs> That's uh, what I suspected. Yeah, uh, the equidistance, I think officially it's maybe two and a half meters, but it always feels like there's only these kind of help lines. <laughs> there's very seldom like several lines uh, to, to show that there is a height. But in the south, it's less flat, uh, but I haven't been orienteering in the south that much. Uh, but there is also an area in the middle of the country um, where it's like sand dunes and this kind of more like small scale hills. Uh, so it's, yeah, those areas are quite nice. Okay. Um, I'm guessing that since you have the federation, you probably also have the national champs, um, which exactly. usually comes with any kind of professional sport. What about other competitions like club championships, for example, that we have in Poland? Is there anything like that in the Netherlands? Yeah, so there's, like you said, the national champs, we have that. Uh, but also as like for the scale, when when people start to register for uh, like age classes, for example, I was joining the national championships sprint and there were three women participated in the women 21. And then like in, in every age category, category, there's usually someone and some, yeah, I think the a bit older categories are more represented and then the youth it's, it's not that many. Um, but then besides the national championships, there is a national competition as well, where they like uh, keep track of a ranking throughout the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that well, most of the Sundays there is a competition. Uh, that's so it's not, not bad. so. Yeah, no, that's that's really nice. And um, the nice thing is also that they they continue in like October and November. And now I sort of missed the middle championships because I didn't expect them to be in January. <laughs> so I I wasn't like prepared. I just went uh, for Christmas to my parents, and then I realized afterwards maybe I should have come a few weeks later for the national championships. But I. I just didn't check the calendar because I didn't <laughs> didn't think about that possibility. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm thinking where to go from here. It's. it's I'm still thinking about the, the the layout of the competitions and how many you actually have during the year. This is quite impressive. Uh, with just five clubs around, you know, to have a competition it's almost every weekend that you can attend to. And Netherlands is not that big, so it's not that big of a deal to actually travel even to a, a different part of the country, right? You would say so as coming from a different country. Like uh, like here in Sweden, we traveled to Hleftio for Tio Mila, and that was... I don't know if you would drive straight. It was maybe 12, 14 hours. I, I don't know. It was a, a very long drive. Yeah. But in the Netherlands, like a two hours drive is considered far. Okay. Because <laughs> that's not like something you would normally do. Oh, uh, because okay. every, well, you, you can if you. You're so like, extravagant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. Like the place where I grew up, it was five hours to drive to Paris. So then, and, and Paris in our head was like far away because okay. I mean, the capital <laughs> of not the next country, but the country after that. So yeah, that, that gives a feeling of how people in the Netherlands think about <laughs> <laughs> traveling hours. It's, uh, it's yeah. super interesting. It actually reminded me of the conversation I had with my daughter not so long ago. And uh, I, I was, she, she was going to some amusement park with her friends and one of the parents. And uh, she said that they had a discussion about how far it is to drive there. And uh, someone said, oh, it's about uh, one and a half hours. And all the girls were like, oh, no, it's so long. And my daughter is, what? Just one, one and a half hours? <laughs> because she's used to traveling to competitions, you know, at, usually somewhere closer to the border of Poland, because in the center of Poland, uh, the terrains are not that interesting. So we have to go to the mountains, to the... Uh, towards the north to the seaside or to Czech Republic. So it's usually at least three hours, usually around four, five hours of driving. So that's what she's used to. One and a half hours seems very short to her. <laughs> yeah, it's all a, a matter of perspective there exactly. too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so uh, so you have those competitions and uh, how, how, would you, how would you rate 
the maps of the terrains that are available in the Netherlands compared to the ones that you have experiences with in Switzerland, Norway, Sweden. Yeah, well, of course, living in Sweden, it's easy to get a bit spoiled with uh, yes. up updated maps and, and the kind of like variation in terrain you can get. But so to know that like the history of quite many maps in, in the Netherlands is that they organized the military world games in 2004. So quite a lot of maps are still coming from 2004. Uh, and that's, that was like a big uh, impulse to, to draw a lot of maps or to hire map drawers to, to come and make maps uh, in the Netherlands. Right. And also many maps are in like military training areas uh, because actually that's it's a bit the opposite to Sweden that in the Netherlands it's easier to do orienteering at military training areas because there you are allowed to leave the paths and in other forests it's usually protected so oh. you're not yeah you're not normally allowed to leave the paths officially uh, it won't like I've never heard it happened that you would <laughs> like go from one path to the other through the forest and somebody would say hey i call the police but it's you're not supposed to do that so that's that makes it much more difficult to organize orienteering competitions or even trainings especially interesting why is it like that is it to protect those forests they are afraid yeah. that people will just trample over the plants exactly so uh, a lot of the forest in the Netherlands are all also really protected as in this i don't know if you know the natura 2000 yes uh, we have like this as European well in poland protection yeah uh, because there is relatively little forest in the netherlands and then especially those like bigger forests where it makes sense to have an orienteering map those are quite often protected so especially also in the season where the the birds lay their eggs that's usually when the whole netherlands does sprint orienteering because you wouldn't get the permit to organize an orienteering competition. Yeah. And this is actually, uh, when I talked to organizers, this is part of the, the biggest cost of organizing orienteering competition in the Netherlands is that you have to get this permit and you have to like apply for it. And yeah, there are some costs connected to it and hmm. they would also limit the amount of runners that you have uh, because to protect the forest. So it's easier right. to get a permit for doing a trail run with uh, 10,000 people <laughs> than uh, an orienteering race with 200 participants. I think that's that's the, the impression that I got. At least. Amazing, but but it, it does make sense. And I kind of, I, I understand being considerate regarding the environment. And I and I know the same thing happens in Sweden, right? You, the, the, in Sweden, there are also these protected zones that are protected for some time during the year. And uh, then, in those zones or orienteering competitions are not organized. Yeah, and then what you see in Sweden is that those zones, because they depend on, on the local climate. They, they travel they north, shift. right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so if you want to do orienteering every weekend, you have to travel like above this zone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. And I feel, I feel like we, we should be considerate regarding um, the wildlife that we have around yeah. us. And I like that. Um, yes. I how, do think how... that orienteers in general, because we like we need the forest to practice our sports. So we have, we I think that. most of us are take care of the forest. Like yes. if you would run somewhere and see, oh, somebody dropped uh, like a gel wrapping or whatever, then you, well, at least I get a bit annoyed. It's like you, you put it in your bag and at least you try <laughs> to close it uh, or you leave it at a control. But yeah, I, I am the same. It. It's like. Yeah. First of all, it's totally not acceptable to me uh, to litter uh, anywhere, uh, not only in the forest. But um, yeah, I get annoyed when I see it. It happened only once to me where I was actually like, uh, I, I was on a competition with the national team, that make, which makes it even worse. And uh, uh, I was the last person to leave the place where we, we were sitting and there were some things that were left over like bottles, cups, uh, starting bibs. <clears throat> so I, I took a photo. I played, placed this photo on our uh, on our Facebook page for for the national team, and I, I gave the people some scolding. And this is the first and only time where this actually happened. I, I've never seen anything like this later, which makes me happy. Uh, but I also think that, as you mentioned, people generally doing orienteering are quite thoughtful 
regarding this. And yeah. uh, when, when, for example, we go to the uh, forest guards and ask them about the competition, they always worry that we will leave a mess and stuff like that. But uh, I understand why they worry, because uh, maybe other people leave uh, these kind of, uh, you know, not cleaned up places after themselves, but it never happens in orienteering, as far as I know, at least. We should try to keep the good uh, good image, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely think so too. So, uh, but let's come back to the forests that are in the Netherlands, because another thing that I was wondering is, what kind of forests do you have? Are these wild forests, like old wild forests, or are, 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 they, are these maybe still old but planted forests? Oof. Uh, <clears throat> well, so there is one, for example, like there's national parks and uh, these kind of protected areas. But I'm, in general, I think what you notice as an orienteer when in the forest is that uh, there is a lot of paths so uh, it never feels that wild as if you are in Sweden and you can I mean I think it's very seldom that you would run an entire leg from one control to another without passing a path at least uh, so they're definitely very civilized in that way uh, yeah okay but yeah um, it's not like you see that all the trees are in a line and it's all planted in that way, no. Okay, I get it. Um, do, do you think it's possible to get on a high level when it comes to orienteering training in Netherlands? I think then maybe the amount of maps would make it difficult. Uh, and also that you don't get a lot of training in um, like reading height contours and, and just in general, the um, uh, variety in control details. So now, for example, we are preparing for the, the world championships with uh, actually for the first time, a full team from the Netherlands with three men and three women. And then um, we, as the more experienced runners, we have two runners from the Netherlands who haven't done orienteering outside of the Netherlands. So we should like provide them with material to just see what does a cliff look like? Because there, there isn't a map with a cliff in the Netherlands or how these big boulders can look like because there are no boulders in the exactly. Netherlands. Exactly, that, that's why I asked the question because that's what I was thinking yeah. about. You're probably missing sometimes even in, entirely on you know all the maps that you have in the country. Uh, some features that are quite common in other places. Yeah. But then again, I think you can get pretty good at it if you, uh, well, if you adapt the training, like you can do a training just taking away all the paths. And of course, if it's a very dense path network, that may be a bit difficult because usually when a mapper draws a path, they would maybe adapt a bit what it looks like around because... Yes. I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it often becomes a bit strange, the maps. Yes. Um, but you can for sure learn how to use your compass properly. And it's very high speed orienteering. So just running fast through a forest, which is maybe not always that easily runnable. There can be quite a lot of undergrowth. Uh, so you can learn a lot. But I think what's also a, a challenge is that the clubs usually don't have a lot of club trainings. And this is partly because of the problem with the, the permits. So maybe that's mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why there are so many competitions is because of it's, it's kind of a substitute for like club trainings. Yeah. Most clubs wouldn't like, I don't think there's a club that has a clubhouse and with like many, many maps in the area. So you would travel a bit further and usually then for a competition and, and use that to, to improve your orienteering. Makes sense. Makes sense. And then... To be able to compete on the level where you get to run uh, as part of the national team, you probably still have to travel outside of the Netherlands and experience some other terrains too. So the official rule for the national team is that you should uh, you get um, an advantage if you come top three in the national championships. Then, like in the beginning of the year, they send out uh, an invitation 
invitation for everyone who is interested to let them know, let the, the Federation know that they like like interested in qualifying to the team. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or in, in qualifying for certain competitions. Right. Like we don't really have a national team in that, that way. It's oh. for each, each competition, there would be, they would be asking who is interested I and see. then make a selection based on that. I see. But, <laughs> I think that so far it hasn't happened that there were more people interested than spots. So, <laughs> uh, it's mainly to show that you are physically capable of uh, finishing the course within maybe the maximum time and then preferably shown in the Netherlands that you're at least in the top level in the Netherlands. Right. Then, then you would be, uh, yeah, they make Consider. a decision based on this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the rules, let's say that you want to qualify for World of League or Team Champs. How do you do that in, for the in Netherlands? Well, so the easiest thing would be to make sure to run a national championship and then preferably win it. Then, then you would be almost guaranteed with the spot. Okay. Yeah. And if you like come in the third spot. So now this year, for example, there is a. a uh, one guy who came uh, third and he is joining so it's it just depends on the amount of interest as well so this is really okay. something that has has grown in the last few years that so yeah so that does, does it depend on on the on the number of spots that the federation wants to send to the competition uh, or so i'm actually asking if the national championship race is the only the only place where you need to perform to be able to join the team because for example in Poland for for judo teams you have like three or four different races and then the combined effort is the result and uh, they are calculated into points and you know if you if you are in the top four let's say uh, in terms of European youth or interior champs you get to participate in the champs right uh, mm. But from what you're saying, it looks like there's just, you know, this one competition, you have this one chance, and if you blew it, if you blow it, uh, you, you, you're you done. Am I right? Well, it's not it's not that strict that you have to come at the podium, but it's more that it benefits your uh, case, your selection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so it's, it's really just a, a matter that came up quite recently because there haven't been that many people interested. And also right. it's not like the Federation sends you in a way that you get support. So you have to choose for yourself that, okay, I want to compete at the world championship and I want to find my own sponsors or pay the entry fee. Uh, and then if they think you have the right profile to be able to at least like, yeah, uh, complete the course to have a chance to do that within the maximum time, then they could decide, okay, that's, that's fine with us. And then, uh, they might have to like uh, revise their guidelines if the interest is getting higher. But it I just see. hasn't see. been so, a need for them. Okay, yeah, I get it now. So just just because there aren't too many people that are interested in participating in World of Interesting Champs, you, you never developed a need to actually have more strict rules regarding who is coming to the competition. Yeah. Got it. And And then the next question I wanted to ask is something you've already touched. Uh, how is it financed? So you said that the Orienteering Federation doesn't support you financially and you have to pay for everything coming to the World Orienteering Champs by yourself or by sponsors. Uh, is, it, is it easy to, or difficult to find sponsors to support you in that, in that way? So what they do organize from the National Federation is that they, <laughs> uh, they buy like t-shirts. So we at least like, we can look like a team and, yes. uh, and represent one team. Uh, so we get those uh, t-shirts to run in at the competitions. Uh, and they support a lot in like administration and um, the communication with them is really good. So I've, I've heard from other countries that although they would have maybe stricter rules for selection and maybe uh, in that way that it was still difficult to make sure that they would be entered in the right start group in event or, or things like this. So in, yeah, they provide a lot of support, but not financially. Um, and then I think it really depends. And I think 
like how easy it is to get sponsors so you maybe if you have good contacts in the Netherlands and and the, the fee is not that high it might be easier but it, it really like depends also on the competition so for example uh, this year on walk uh, the organizers found really good sponsors so even though it is in Switzerland it is very cheap to join so very that nice. suddenly suddenly becomes like a thing that makes that it's easier for the Netherlands to have a full team cool. than at AOC where the prices are much higher cool I didn't know that uh, I mean that uh, walk this year um, yeah. is, is not that expensive no it's really they uh, they had a deal where you pay the entry fee and then you get the accommodation for the whole week covered which is a very, wow. very good yeah yeah that's really uh yeah pretty amazing i think uh our accommodation with board with food no no okay we cook for ourselves but uh it, it is with a kitchen so it's yeah every country actually which uh every country gets accommodation for three men three women and two coaches at least during the competition week very nice yeah very nice i can tell you that once we went to jaywalk that was in switzerland it was like i don't know five years ago something like this maybe four um and we also were cooking for ourselves and we brought our own cook for the competition and this was the guy that is currently the best elite runner in poland <laughs> nice so there you go for those of you uh, people watching uh, if you didn't know Michal Olenik, who was also here on the channel, had a chat with me some few weeks ago. Um, he's a great cook as well. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody died, everybody performed very well. Uh, this was actually the only time when we brought a medal from Jaywalk, at least in the years when I'm coaching the team, which is the seventh year so far. So nothing to complain about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> awesome. I mean, um, it's I, I like it when... And I, and, I, and I also see this uh, happening in other countries as well. I like it when uh, the, the organizers are very considerate regarding the participation fees and the cost of the competition in general. And I remember when, uh, for example, jaywalks or years are happening in the Scandinavian countries that are in general considered as more expensive ones compared to the central Europe, I guess. Um, they, they really try to make things as cheap as possible. Sometimes it's a little bit more expensive, sometimes a little bit less. But I also remember, for example, when we were in Norway, uh, it was probably like eight or nine years ago. It was quite cheap compared to how it normally looks like in Norway. So thumbs up for the organizers, I guess. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you're planning uh, to go to walk this year. You're part of the team selected to participate. It's not that far away. Uh, are you paying entirely for yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I get a lot of support from my Swedish club as well. So that, that helps a lot. That's really nice. Uh, so I'm actually also going, um, for a training camp before the competition, uh, which is not, well, that's also something that we then organize ourselves from the Netherlands. Like it's not like we have a pre camp for the whole team. Actually now we will have maybe one day where we'll be training together with the whole team, uh, and that's that's also a first because we haven't been that many runners before. So uh, mm -hmm. I've quite often been alone. But in Norway in the World Cup this spring, we were also with three runners and had even a few days of training. So that was really nice. But then, yeah, we organized the trainings ourselves. So then it's a lot is my my partner and my boyfriend who puts out the controls and uh, helps us in the terrain and then. When we get back to the accommodation, he takes in the controls as well. So it often means a lot of uh, work for him. But actually, in, in Switzerland, we found other national teams which have been very nice to offer that we can join their trainings. Exactly. So this is a thing which is, is really, really nice that a lot of the teams understand that if you have few runners, it's hard to organize <clears throat> things like that. Yeah. And they're very open in, in joining. That's super yeah. nice. Um, so if, if somebody watching this has this problem, it's really, really recommended to reach out to other nations and just ask if you are able to join. Because my experience is that everybody is super nice in volunteering <laughs> and very helpful. So if you, if you just uh, you know, find the right contact, 
very, very often you will be able to join a training camp that is professionally organized and uh, people will just allow you to participate. I mean, I would allow you, uh, as, and I'm talking as a national team coach, so as long as it, it doesn't disrupt our training, uh, training camp in general. So for example, you know, sometimes people might be limited in terms of places in the accommodation and they might not allow you to sleep with the rest of the team together because there are just no places. Sometimes the transport will be the problem. And these are usually the only two things get, that can go wrong because the rest, you know, if printing the, the additional maps is not that big of a deal and uh, spending like, I don't know, 15 minutes more in the forest because you have some a few, few more runners participating, it's not that big of a deal. So, you know, maybe there are some teams that are protecting their training secrets. I don't know, but I've never met them so far. <laughs> yeah, I think in general, everyone is very helpful and open. Yeah, it's yes. very nice. Yeah, so um, thank you to all the teams that are, that are helping. I can tell you a, a quick story that happened uh, last JWOC in Portugal. Uh, I don't know if, if you know, but Portugal uh, JWOC was split into two parts because uh, the summer races were disrupted by the forest thing, uh, sorry, in, uh, fire danger. And uh, we were just simply not allowed to run in the forest. Therefore, they moved the forest part of the JWOC to September, I think. Um, and November even, I think. Or November even, yeah. That's why, yeah. that's why I paused because I'm not sure. But somewhere in the autumn. And the, and, and some of the teams, because it's world champs, then you can imagine that for some of the teams, it was a big problem because United States, Australia, New Zealand, right? All of those very remote places. Now, suddenly they have to consider whether they want to travel back to Europe again for just a weekend, really, three days, spend a lot of time on plane, uh, sorry, a lot of money on plane tickets and time as well, flying this way and that way. And obviously nobody planned for this, so there was no budget for it. And uh, for some countries, it didn't even matter because they are still paying for themselves one way or another. Uh, and of course, there were lots of discussions during that summer week, uh, which was super hot uh, over there. And during one of the last uh, team officials meetings that we've had, someone raised a question and asked, I think it was a coach from the Australian team, and asked if it's possible that the team will, or part of the team will come for the autumn round of JWOC, but without the coach. And if, is, if, is it possible that they can join another team and the other team will like completely take care of them? And there were plenty of nations that were happy to help. <laughs> yeah. Well, <it> included. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, it always raises my spirit to see how, uh, um, in general, how, how, the, how our community looks like. It's, it's really good. Yes. Uh, all right. Where were we? So we talked about clubs. We talked about um, maps, forests, competitions, uh, qualifications for national champs. Um, what else is there interesting when it comes to orienteering in Netherlands? You said There's something. One... Yeah, mm -hmm. go on, go on, go on. I'll, There's I'll hold... one, uh, one world ranking event every year, usually. So that might be a nice one to know if you like would consider going to the Netherlands for orienteering. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually in autumn, there's a two-day event where one of the days is a world ranking. And often, I think, they even add a sprint the evening before. Um, so that would be... Uh, if you want to do exotic orienteering without too many uh, elevation gain, <laughs> want to save your legs a bit. Yeah, it's it's a really nice event. And um, there are actually usually a lot of the people joining it are from Belgium. So uh, Belgian orienteering is quite a bit bigger than in the Netherlands. Um, they even have two federations for like the French part and the Dutch part. But mm, it seems like there's more like orienteering families in Belgium doing it with their whole family and then there's also more children in that way and there's yeah in general more um, a structured national team so that's that's quite a big difference between the countries that are quite alike in in other things I see um, you, you also mentioned that uh, access to the forests that are in military zones uh, is a little bit easier so 
Um, I thought also about the military team. Do you have something like military team in Netherlands? Yes, yeah. And the military team goes to the military world games, I think, every year. But in general, at least uh, quite often. So they have been much more organized than the national team. Uh, yeah. And so now this year, one of our coaches in the national team, he is also from the military. So he has experience in going to the, the military world games, but I don't think he has been to the like world championships before. So, oh, so that's interesting. So that, does this mean that the military, military team doesn't join the world orienteering championships? Usually not. And I think a uh, difference there is the finance as well. So if you are working at the military, then I think both that you don't need to take holidays to mm -hmm. compete at the military world games. And I, I also think you don't need to pay if you go to the military world games. But then if you Probably. would decide to go to, to the, like they call it the civil championship. So for them, it's, <laughs> they make this difference in that way. Uh -huh. uh, then, then I think you're just going more as a normal competitor. Yeah. So it's not in this way that in other countries where you can get like a professional career financed by running for the military. It's more okay. that you would get the participation to the military world games. And I think they do train sometimes. Uh, and of course you would have like easier access to all these military maps. Okay, so, okay. It so it's, it's not as good as this, for example, in, in, in here in Poland. Because here in Poland, you can, um, the best path for someone who wants to do orienteering professionally is to join the military team. So you just go to the military, you have some training for a few weeks, and then essentially you're paid to run orienteering and you get money for training camps. Some of the training camps are paid fully by the military. Uh, some of the training camps are paid fully or semi-fully semi by the Polish Orienteering Federation, but still you get a lot of financing, you get uh, like standard salary from uh, from the military as well. Uh, of course, you are obliged to participate in military world orienteering champs. That makes total sense. Uh, but there is also no problem with going to like civil orienteering championships. And uh, yeah. If, if oh, I think it's really different in the Netherlands that if you're at the military, then like you're most of all an employee at the military right and then you can do orienteering in addition to that as like yes but you still have to do all the military work yes right yeah so the the people that are currently in polish military team they don't do that they they, they can focus fully on training and resting <laughs> yeah. so that's a good deal that's a good deal and, yeah. uh, and you still get the salary out of that uh, so that's definitely something to consider and as i said it's probably the best way I think the only exceptions would be people that really have another source of money. Mm. Uh, but because otherwise you won't be able to support yourself. I mean, it's, I, I, I am talking with some of the best runners in the world here on the channel. And it, it amazes me when I hear that someone who, who is running on a highest level in the world is also able to work almost full time that is an achievement. Oh my God. That is, that is a huge achievement in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I work 80% now and I find that already also because I, I'm still <clears throat> like at the same time, I'm trying to be physically as, as fit as I can to be able to compete at the world champs. And then I also have this technique where I have to yes. catch up with the, the best orienteers. So sometimes it's uh it's a challenge to to get everything uh in the schedule but yeah i'm sure it is <laughs> it has to be <laughs> yeah um, but yeah that's that's why we do orienteering we like challenges that's that's true we i, I mean i do <laughs> yeah i mean if you, if you don't like a challenge i think you might want to skip the map and just do running for example it's still a challenge but it's in yeah. my eyes at least less of a challenge <clears throat> Um, yeah, I very often wonder about it, like what separates people who do just even cross-country running, but just through, on paths, not through the forest, and people that do orienteer. Like what, what do you have to have 
which part of your brain tells you just take the map and run through the forest. Yeah. Ignore the paths. Paths are wrong. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a bit uh, a feeling that you want to have freedom and uh, independency also. Like it's quite a big difference that you follow signs or that you choose your own route. Mm. Uh, so at least some some feeling or striving for independence or like uh, the freedom to go wherever you want. Maybe that's uh, part of it too. I think there are many answers. I like yours. Yeah. Mine would probably be that I just like being close to nature and I feel closer to nature outside of the path than on the path. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. I also like this feeling when you're running through the forest and the, the branches are whooshing next to you. <laughs> yeah I, I remember posting a video on instagram where i was running in the snow and someone was just like oh what are you doing <laughs> why are you even considering to run in the snow well i live in sweden i do orienteering <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i guess at some point all of us are running in the snow at least a few days a year <laughs> yeah well we're getting less and less of that in poland mm. during the i mean yeah i, I remember that when I was, I'm doing orienteering for almost 30 years. So I would guess that my first 10 years of orienteering, winter was no map uh, season, at least for four months, something like this, because there was just too much snow. You had like snow up, up to your knees and, you know, you can run one kilometer in that kind of a snow, but then you get tired and, and you can't run anymore. So orienteering was uh, really not doable, but recent seasons, we can run whole winter on the map maybe sometimes you get snow up to your ankles but that doesn't bother you really too much so we we can see the changes happening yeah. with yeah. our own eyes but very clearly even living away from the coast yeah um all right hmm. i think what i could add is that we talk mainly about forests uh, not springs but- Yes. So the Netherlands being a very populated country, there's a lot of like old city centers, uh, which are super nice to run sprints in. So I'm, I'm really looking forward actually to the European champs in uh, Belgium in 2025. Then probably I can be a lot at home visiting my parents and training in the Netherlands or Belgium mm-hmm. for like sprint or interior. Do you like running sprints? I do. Uh, mainly because it's like an easier way of getting into orienteering and is, like yes. sometimes having a good race <laughs> and uh but i started more as a forest orienteer partly because of my boyfriend who did only forest orienteering and also because well i like being in nature um so but then when i was world champs in sprint then of course uh there was quite a big uh invitation to do more sprint and then it was going better and better and then i what i like is that in a sprint i can get physically more tired Mm -hmm. and now with forced orienteering i'm still i have to break down like slow down quite a lot to not get lost so right then the physical aspect of running sprint orienteering is sometimes more fun um but yeah it's also a bit i would say it's a bit more stressful uh you have to make your decision and it's either left or right of a building, for example, but you cannot, well, I start straight through and then <laughs> make my plan a, a bit later. Yeah, it's it's definitely more stressful just being in the cities also. Uh, so I really like doing both. Yeah, I, I feel like the thing that you mentioned, I feel like on the sprint, you have to always be one step forward where in the forest you can like, you shouldn't be doing that really, but if you choose your route choice during the first 10 meters of running it, it's probably not that big of a deal. Even if you yeah. go a little bit in the wrong direction, you can make a correction uh, to turn a little bit more to the right and still be quite okay with it. On a sprint, yeah, you should always know where you want to go before you start the leg. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, of course, the, the sandstone terrain in Czech Republic, for example. Usually you want to know if you go either up or down, or uh, it's a bit more distinct route choices there. But in general, uh, you have a bit more, uh, a bit more time to think in the forest. 
Sure. Um, so what are your goals for Walk this year? Uh, it will be a challenging goal, but uh, my main goal is to come top 20 in the long distance. And I don't think it's impossible because I think I was 47th in Davos at the long distance on World Cup. Um, so then if you count away some people that will not be allowed to run because definitely require a really good race so just limiting mistakes and and uh, pushing hard <laughs> yeah all right i mean you have good terrains to practice at uh so not much time left though <laughs> no <laughs> but, but if <laughs> you feel kidding. that if you feel that you have grounds to think that this is achievable then it's probably a good goal i hope yeah, you'll be able to achieve it yeah it's always good to have a ambitions goal as long as you make it makes it you it motivates you instead of like getting scary, too scary stuff about it yeah. yeah yeah absolutely all right i'm out of questions if you think that there is something else interesting regarding the orienteering in the netherlands that you want to add then go ahead no i think that was the the sprint orienteering was the one that i wanted to add that it's really a lot of fun and also like for example for national coaches to to think about when preparing for belgium that the netherlands has nice maps too yeah got it but, uh, yeah good then if thank you very much uh for joining it was a pleasure i will be happy to talk more with you with another uh, occasion that possibly will happen in the future you're a very interesting person, uh, very um, with, with a very interesting background as well, not only in regards to orienteering, but your work as well, and very open. So thank you very much for reaching out. Uh, and thanks to you, we've had this amazing conversation and I've had an amazing evening. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.